Today I'm talking about live action superhero movies and sharing my views on the current state of the genre and industry. And then I've also got a top 10 list of my favorite superhero movies for you. So let's rock this. Hi everyone, how you doing? Welcome back, I'm Fuzz. So uh, live action superhero movies are the uh, topic of the day. Uh, I've got a top 10 list here of my favorite movies from the genre. Uh, but before I get into that, I wanted to uh, share some of my thoughts about the genre, uh, about the current state of the genre and where I think it's headed, what kind of future it may or may not have. Now, this is uh, not a topic that I've really addressed much on this channel before, and uh, some of you who are regular viewers may be wondering why you don't really hear me talk a whole lot about superhero movies on this channel. Well, the answer is really quite simple, uh, and that is superhero burnout is real. Uh, and I know this because I've been experiencing it myself firsthand uh, in recent years, especially with the Marvel movies. And I was someone who really got into these films in a big way for a while. Um, I went through a period over the course of maybe about a decade or so uh, where I would watch all kinds of superhero stuff, either both TV series and movies, and uh, I would watch basically anything I could get my hands on. And all of this lasted for me personally up until about Avengers Endgame, uh, at which point I was really starting to uh, get a little burned out on the whole genre in general. I had been starting to burn out on the genre leading up to those last couple Avengers films, uh, but by the time Endgame was done, I was definitely feeling the uh, burnout in full force. But let me back up a little bit here and talk a bit about my own personal journey with this genre, my own personal history with the uh, superhero genre, because I never really got into uh, reading comic books when I was growing up. Um, a lot of people love comics when they're young and, and carry it into uh, adulthood with them. Uh, that was really not my thing. I was just not a big fan of reading comics. But I loved superheroes when I was a kid. Uh, it's just that all of my exposure to the genre was through moving pictures, either uh, TV shows or, or film. But because I never really got into reading the comics, uh, I just never really had that uh, attachment to the source material that many comic fans do. Everything I knew about superheroes came from whatever I saw on TV or whatever movies I'd watch. And for me, it started off with the old Batman TV show, right? Uh, the Adam West show. Uh, I used to love that show when I was a kid. It was one of my favorite shows, uh, and I used to watch uh, reruns all the time. But I was also into shows like uh, The Incredible Hulk with Lou Ferrigno and Bill Bixby um, and the old George Reeves Superman show, the black and white Superman show from back in the day. Uh, and then, of course, Superman 78 was a huge deal uh, when it came out. I was like seven years old when it first came out. I think I even remember watching some uh, made-for-TV Captain America movie at one point uh, when I was a kid um, that I thought was really cool. Um, in fact. I actually injured myself playing Captain America uh, the day after that uh, that made-for-TV movie aired. Uh, I ended up at the uh, hospital with uh, some stitches in my ankle. Uh, I was uh, bouncing all over the place while I was taking the garbage out uh, and pretending to be Captain America and uh, ended up injuring myself. Uh, but the funny thing is, I remember more about the injury than I do the movie itself. But the point is, I was into any kind of superhero stuff that was, uh, that was out when I was a kid. Uh, I was definitely into it. Uh, Batman and Superman have always been my favorites, uh, but really at the time when I was a kid, I loved all kinds of superhero movies. Oh, and I was also into the Six Million Dollar Man. Uh, who was that? Lee Majors? Uh, in that role, um, was a huge, huge fan of the Bionic Man, which I think probably qualifies as a, as a superhero show. Uh, we can certainly make the case that the Bionic Man was superhero adjacent. But Superman 78 was the real uh, game changer uh, for live action superhero movies when I was a kid. It was the first time we really got a, a real motion picture, right? A serious treatment of the subject matter. Richard Donner brought Superman to life in a huge way on the big screen. And uh, I can remember just being completely in awe at uh, seven years old, sitting there in the theater watching this movie for the first time. Uh, I was so excited. We really had just not ever seen anything quite like that before, uh, as far as the live action superhero genre goes. 
Now, we'd had, uh, I, like I said, we had a couple made-for-TV movies. I think there was a Captain America movie. There was a Batman movie at one point. But before Superman 78, we never really got a, a real movie, a real, like, motion picture that was treated seriously. Uh, the special effects at the time were pretty groundbreaking for what they were. So I kind of tend to think of Superman 78 as, uh, as ground zero for, like, the beginning of the uh, live-action superhero film genre. But then once I got into my teens, uh, I stopped really caring about the genre. I wasn't really into superheroes at that point. Uh, I got to a point where I thought it was just silly uh, kid stuff, not something to be taken seriously. So when Tim Burton came out with his uh, Batman movies featuring Michael Keaton in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, I just really didn't have any interest in those movies. So I never even watched those movies uh, until just a few years ago. Um, I remember at the time thinking, you know, uh, the, the Michael Keaton Batman movies, I just assumed they were going to be cheesy and hokey like the Adam West Batman. I had no idea what these Michael Keaton Batman movies were actually like. I just had a, a preconceived notion of it in my head, right? But I was also in my early 20s, my late teens, early 20s. So, you know, I had other things to do. I was into other stuff. I was into music. I wasn't really caring too much about the superhero genre at that time. And that lack of interest I had in superhero movies uh, lasted well into, uh, well, early adulthood. Um, I'd say from my teens to about my early 30s, I didn't really have any interest in superhero movies at all. I just thought it was, like I said, uh, cheesy, hokey kid stuff, right? Not really the kind of thing that, uh, that I thought I would personally be into. But then I saw Sam Raimi's Spider-Man, and that completely changed uh, my whole perception of what a superhero movie could be. Well, first off, I was blown away by the uh, the visual effects in Spider-Man at the time. Um, it was a huge leap in quality from what I remembered about the old uh, Christopher Reeve Superman films. Uh, special effects had come a long way uh, since then, and uh, I had just been away from the genre for so long that I was just totally clueless about the uh, current state of the genre at the time. Sam Raimi's Spider-Man was really my introduction to the uh, the modern superhero movie genre, right? The modern era of uh, superhero movie making. It was the film that brought me back into superhero movies after all that time away and uh, got me interested in the genre again. And then Batman Begins uh, more or less sealed the deal for me. And next thing I know, I was all in uh, on superhero movies. Those two movies uh, set me on a path where I just got totally hooked uh, on the genre for probably close to a decade. I watched most of the Marvel movies. I watched DC movies. I watched all kinds of different series like uh, what they had on Netflix. They had uh, Jessica Jones and Luke Cage, The Defenders. Um, you know, I was watching a lot of the CW stuff like uh, Arrow and The Flash, uh, even Supergirl. So I just got all in on this stuff. I went on a huge uh, kick there for a number of years where I was uh, very much invested in the superhero genre. Now, before we get too deep into the uh, analysis portion of the video, uh, we do have a couple new channel members here in Fuzzland uh, that I'd like to give a quick shout out to. Uh, first off, Chad Eldred uh, just became a member of the Fuzz Club this week. Chad, thank you so much. I really appreciate your support of the channel. Um, and then also uh, Ghost Dog also became a new member of the Fuzz Club this week. Um, both you guys, thank you both so much for your support of the channel. I really appreciate it. It means a lot to me. I look forward to getting to know you guys better, maybe chatting with you in comments or chat or whatnot uh, moving forward. Uh, you know, thanks so much, guys. You guys are awesome. And if any of you would like to know more about the Fuzz Club, uh, just click on the Fuzz Club link in the description below, or you can also click that join button down below and it'll bring up all the membership information for you. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit more about both Marvel and DC in more detail, uh, but I'm going to take each entity uh, separately. Uh, and full disclosure here, I should let you guys know this uh, right off the bat. Uh, when it comes to uh, Marvel versus DC, I have always been a much bigger fan of DC 
uh, than Marvel movies. That's just mainly because of Superman and, and Batman, uh, my two favorite superheroes. I've just always been more partial uh, to uh, DC characters than Marvel characters. Now, that's not to say that I dislike Marvel movies. Uh, that's not the case at all. When I first got back into superhero movies in the early 2000s, I was getting into both Marvel and DC films. Uh, like I said, watching pretty much anything I could get my hands on. I was a big fan of the X-Men movies. Um, even though, you know, prior to the first one, I didn't even know anything about the X-Men movies. I didn't know much about the story. Uh, what I heard about it, I liked. The idea of a school for kids with superpowers, yeah, that sounded like a really cool story to me. And I loved that first trilogy with Patrick Stewart and Hugh Jackman. Great stuff. You know, I thought early on, Marvel put out some pretty good movies. You know, I like the earlier Marvel stuff. Uh, you know, I'm not really into anything they're putting out now, but there was a time where I did appreciate uh, the films that they were making. You know, I got into the first couple Iron Man movies. Uh, I got into the Captain America movies, really liked all the Captain America movies. And uh, ultimately, I enjoyed the Avengers too, at least for a period of time. But I'll be honest, uh, with Marvel, I kind of started to tire of all the jokes and wisecracks in their movies. I've always been someone who's preferred a darker, uh, more serious tone for the superhero movies that I get into. You know, the way I see it, if I want to hear a bunch of jokes and wisecracks, I'll go watch a comedy. I don't watch superhero movies for the comedy aspect. That's, I'm not into that. I'm there for the action and the spectacle and the cool superpowers and uh, the basic good versus evil fight. That's why I watch superhero movies. I don't watch superhero movies because I'm looking for a comedy. That's just not my thing. So that aspect of the MCU, the whole comedy aspect, it didn't really resonate with me. And frankly, it started to get a little old for me. That's one area where I always just felt DC was a little stronger. Uh, you know, with the darkness and tone, the more serious tone uh, to their films, uh, and essentially presenting a more grounded portrayal of these characters and stories uh, overall. And the films that I've always enjoyed the most from Marvel uh, have often been uh, the ones that have taken a more serious and darker tone. I mean, to the extent that that occurred in the MCU. Now here I got to note something about Marvel. Uh, I think that uh, for me personally, one thing that kind of soured me on Marvel in general early on was their firing of Edward Norton as Bruce Banner and the Hulk. I mean, I thought that was just an incredibly stupid move, uh, especially to replace him with a dimwit like Mark Ruffalo. I mean, Mark Ruffalo, I'm sorry, but he sucks. I mean, Edward Norton is a hundred times the actor that Mark Ruffalo is. So I had very little interest in the Hulk uh, once Mark Ruffalo was in the role. I just couldn't connect with the character when Ruffalo was in the role uh, nearly as much as I did when Edward Norton was portraying him. I mean, can you imagine just how much more kick-ass the Avengers would have been if Edward Norton had been in the role the entire time? It would have been awesome! Marvel would have been an even more unstoppable force, and uh, we probably would have gotten a proper Hulk sequel. But after Norton left, it almost seemed like uh, Marvel kind of started treating the Hulk like he was kind of a side character, right? He didn't seem like uh, one of the main Avengers as much anymore once Ruffalo got into that role. It seemed like Hulk was, you know, kind of relegated to side character or sidekick status. Of course, he did some big stuff. He'd come in here and there and, and uh, when the Avengers needed him and do his thing. But I just didn't get the impression that uh, Marvel was very confident in, uh, in the future of the Hulk with someone like Ruffalo in the role. You know, I was never really convinced that uh, someone like Mark Ruffalo could carry a Hulk sequel entirely on his own. And uh, apparently Marvel felt the same way. So that decision to get rid of Edward Norton, it really left a bad taste in my mouth. And I'll tell you, even to this day, I feel like The Incredible Hulk is still one of the better Marvel movies that we ever got out of the MCU. But the big problem with Marvel, as I see it, uh, was the oversaturation, right? Uh, by the time we got to Endgame, uh, it was almost just too much, too much uh, stuff, too much oversaturation. Uh, the Avengers had expanded into this massive ensemble cast of people, and you had to watch like every movie and every series just to know who everyone was and what was going on. People got burned out. Uh, from having to do too much homework anytime they just wanted to watch the latest Marvel movie. And I think that's where the burnout comes from, or at least a lot of it, uh, from too much homework. 
You know, people are craving a good standalone story where they don't have to watch a minimum of two or three or four other series or movies just to know what the hell's going on in the latest movie. And there have been a ton of Marvel series that uh, I would argue have just become uh, too cumbersome to keep up with, uh, while at the same time not even looking interesting enough to, uh, to even bother investing the time into. Marvel oversaturated the public with just a barrage of stuff, but not nearly enough quality to justify the quantity. And I'll tell you straight up, uh, I started to burn out on the Marvel stuff a lot sooner than I did the DC stuff. But the other problem was, after Endgame, there was really nowhere else the MCU could go that was going to get people anywhere near as excited about Marvel as, uh, as they were for the last two Avengers films. I mean, we lost the two biggest characters in the MCU, Iron Man and Captain America. There wasn't a whole lot that they were going to be able to do without Iron Man and Captain America that would uh, generate the buzz to get people excited uh, about a Marvel movie on the same level that they did with the Avengers. They didn't really have a plan for the future of the MCU that anyone really cared about at all. They had one trick left in their back pocket, and, uh, and that ended up being deployed for Spider-Man No Way Home. And I'm talking about the multiverse trick. They brought together and united uh, all three uh, Spider-Man portrayals since the Sam Raimi Spider-Man films, uh, and they essentially explained it away by basically saying it was a multiverse thing. Well, the problem here is that that was the kind of trick that could really only be done once. Because once you start introducing the, the multiverse into everything, um, it becomes kind of ridiculous, right? And almost like an anything goes type scenario, which is essentially what Multiverse of Madness was, right? Kind of an over the top anything goes scenario. Well, I think that's the kind of thing that gets old uh, really quick. Right. If you can just bring back any previous actor from any film, any time uh, and just explain it all away with the multiverse. Yeah, that's pretty weak. It certainly didn't work out too well for the Flash movie, did it? Well, then on top of that, we start to see deeper problems with the quality of the characters, quality of the stories, quality of the content overall. The problem is uh, Disney and Marvel started infusing their movies uh, and series with attributes that advance their preferred cultural and political agenda and messaging as the top priority. At the same time, uh, respect for the characters, uh, respect for the source material, good writing, good storytelling, all of that took a back seat to uh, advancing the cultural message. And people aren't digging it. Right? I mean, it's a huge turnoff to a wide swath of the population. And I think that's a big part of why these more recent films in the last few years have been flopping so badly. People just want good stories and good characters that they can get behind, that they can feel invested in. And they are not getting that right now with Marvel in its current state. All right, so that's Marvel. Uh, let's move on to DC here for uh, a little bit. Um, you know, my return to DC movies uh, started with the Dark Knight trilogy uh, in the uh, mid-2000s, right? I pretty much skipped all the Batman movies in the 90s, including the Michael Keaton movies. Uh, I had never seen those. And uh, to this day, I still haven't seen Batman Forever or Batman vs. Robin. I just figured those were going to be shit, so I didn't bother investing my time into them. But the Dark Knight trilogy is what really got me back into DC, kind of brought me back into the fold. And as I alluded to uh, earlier, Batman Begins was a bit of a game changer for me. Uh, I just loved it when I first saw it. But I also appreciated some of the other DC entries as well. Superman Returns, for example. I got into that one at the time, uh, even though in retrospect, I probably don't care for it as much now as I did at the time. Uh, but at the time, I appreciated that they seemed to be kind of paying tribute to uh, Christopher Reeve with that film. Uh, nowadays, I'd just rather watch a Christopher Reeve uh, Superman movie, right? I, but at the time, it had been a while since we'd seen any kind of Superman movie. So uh, when Superman Returns first came out, I was pretty excited about it. And then Zack Snyder came along with Man of Steel, and I absolutely loved it. I was so excited when it first came out. Um, I mean, he took a totally different approach. 
you know, than what we were used to with, say, like the Christopher Reeve movies, right? Uh, a little darker, a little more serious. Uh, the characters were more conflicted, more complex. And I also love what Zack Snyder did with the uh, the visuals in that film. Uh, I loved it almost immediately. Uh, you know, I was really excited when I saw this film for the first time. It was so cool. And then we got Batman v Superman. And uh, I'll admit, the first time I saw that, which was the theatrical cut, I didn't really like it. Right At the time, I felt like I was bummed out about Batman. I felt like Batman had his head stuck up his ass the entire first half of that movie. It just did not sit well with me. And I say this as someone who likes Ben Affleck's portrayal of the character. I thought Ben Affleck did a good job in the role of, uh, of Batman, but uh, I didn't like him for the first part of uh, Batman v Superman. I just thought the guy seemed just totally dense and clueless. And uh, I was like, come on, man, you're Batman. How could you possibly be this dense? But, uh, you know, that's the way it was. So uh, I didn't care for Batman v Superman when I first saw it. I have since come to appreciate it a lot more, having seen the, the remastered Ultimate Edition extended cut. Uh, it's definitely a much better version of the movie. But I'll be the first to admit that movie still has some pretty significant flaws. And then we got Justice League, the Joss Whedon cut, right? The theatrical edition of Justice League. Uh, and I didn't really care for that one too much either when it first came out. I mean, I had no idea what was going on behind the scenes with Zack Snyder and his daughter and all that. Um, I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to that kind of thing at the time. But even then, when I watched Justice League, I was like, what the hell is this? It seemed like DC was trying to copy Marvel right? It seemed like they were trying to be just like Marvel rather than staking out their own territory and doing something uh, unique uh, to them. They just didn't do that. They were trying to, to be like Marvel. You know, we got a bunch of jokes and wisecracks in the uh, Joss Whedon cut. And uh, I'm sorry, but that cut sucks. Joss Whedon sucks. So uh, yeah, I, I didn't care for it. But then I saw the, uh, the four hour uh, cut, the Snyder cut of Justice League, and I absolutely loved it. And it was at that point that I realized just how much of an abomination the Joss Whedon cut of Justice League really was. But the Snyder cut of Justice League was more or less uh, exactly the kind of film I wanted to see, right? Um, aside from a few flaws, and I'll be the first to, uh, to admit, Zack Snyder's movies, yes, they are flawed. I, I totally get that. The Snyder Cut had this epic scale to it. Uh, it was R-rated. It was a little edgier, a um, little more serious and darker. Um, and I love the, uh, the added character development in the Snyder Cut of Justice League, especially with Cyborg. That was great. Um, it all just worked for me, and I, I love the film. Now, I've got a few words here about Zack Snyder because I know he's kind of a controversial figure, right? Uh, some people just can't stand him. Uh, other people love him. He's very polarizing. So um, I consider myself a fan of, of Zack Snyder's work overall, generally speaking. But the main reason I'm a fan is because I love Zack Snyder's visual aesthetics. I love the look of his films. You know, I like the way he shoots them and the, the cool stuff he does with the camera and with the, uh, with the visual effects and whatnot. That's the main reason uh, that I'm into his films. But I'm also objective enough to say, hey, you know, yeah, Snyder's films, they have their flaws too. Um, even Justice League, which I love and is one of my favorite superhero films, it had some pretty significant flaws. Uh, notably in some of Zack Snyder's casting choices, and of course in his writing as well. His writing isn't always the greatest, but his casting choices have honestly been pretty bizarre at times. I mean, uh, I, the, the one that comes to mind is Jesse Eisenberg in the role of Lex Luthor. I'm like, what the fuck was that? Jesse Eisenberg? I mean, we've had the likes of people like Gene Hackman and Kevin Spacey play Lex Luthor before, and they thought Jesse Eisenberg was going to be a, a fitting substitute? Yeah, yeah, that, uh, that just didn't work for me. I mean, where are all the Jesse Eisenberg fans out there clamoring for more Jesse Eisenberg films? I mean, how did this guy ever get to be a thing? I've just, I've never understood the appeal of Jesse Eisenberg, if that appeal even exists out there, or if he's just someone that's kind of been, uh, you know, forced on us by the Hollywood establishment. Well, needless to say, I could not stand 
Jesse Eisenberg in the role of Lex Luthor. I thought that was a horrible choice. I think it may go down as one of the worst casting choices in uh, in film history. I, you know, I mean, that's a pretty bold statement, but uh, yeah, I feel fairly comfortable saying that. So, but that's what I believe. I, I, I. I can't stand Jesse Eisenberg. I don't know why he's even a thing, honestly. But apparently Zack Snyder felt that was a good role for him. So I don't know. Uh, of course, the other one being Ezra Miller. Uh, you know, I was never really a big fan of Ezra Miller. Even when I first saw Justice League, uh, you know, I just thought he was kind of wrong for the part as well. And Zack Snyder's done that with uh, a number of his movies. He's made some really kind of uninspired uh, casting choices that seem like they're championing mediocrity more than than really serving the film in the best possible way. But even with those problems, uh, I still thought the, the Snyder Cut of Justice League was awesome. Uh, and it was at that point that I realized the critical mistake I think Warner Brothers had made with this film. I mean, it sure seems to me like they kind of fucked over Zack Snyder, right? Uh, I believe if they had stuck with Zack Snyder's vision from the beginning, uh, and really leaned into it and let him finish the story that he started, the state of DC films would be in a very uh, different place today. Um, I think they could have even overtaken Marvel. And it's possible they could be sitting on top of the world right now if they had only just uh, really embraced and followed through with uh, Zack Snyder's vision for the Snyderverse. I mean, they could have done all kinds of cool promotional campaigns to uh, to really ramp up interest in Justice League when it first came out. Like, I think they should have shown it in the theaters, like the Snyder Cut in theaters. I absolutely think they should have done that, right? And uh, I think they should have done it with an intermission so that people can have a bathroom break or whatever. But yeah, show the whole three and a half, four hour cut of Snyderverse in the theaters. You may not get as many showings, but if they had launched a, you know, a significant promotional campaign, I really do think that uh, it would have been a much bigger hit than uh, Joss Whedon's Justice League ended up being when it first came out. You know, they could have done all kinds of cool stuff with their promotional campaigns to really play up the fact that they're different than Marvel, that they've got something different to offer audiences than the uh, jokes and wisecracks we're getting from Marvel. I'm one of the people who wanted to see Snyder uh, be able to continue with the uh, the Justice League series, to be able to, to finish what he started, finish the story uh, that he had intended to tell the whole time. You know, I really wanted to see what happened next. And uh, it has always bothered me that we were just kind of hanging there at the end of uh, the Snyder Cut of Justice League. You know, I wanted to see that war uh, against or with Darkseid. I wanted to see that story uh, fully fleshed out and completed. And I'll admit, when uh, James Gunn was first announced as head of DC, uh, I was slightly optimistic at first. Uh, for a short time, I had a small amount of hope that maybe we'd get to finally see Snyder uh, finish what he'd started, uh, revive the Dark Side storyline, and at least conclude the story with uh, one last Justice League film. But of course, that hope faded very quickly uh, once we learned of James Gunn's actual plans. And I think Gunn has really kind of botched his handling of DC so far, uh, mainly because he came out early on and telegraphed that everything was being rebooted. He basically let us know that the existing movies that uh, he had inherited and were still going to be released uh, didn't matter, right? He basically told us up front, yeah, these next few movies that are coming out, none of them really matter because they don't have anything to do with what I'm planning to do in the uh, the rebooted uh, DC Universe. And then, of course, getting rid of good people like Henry Cavill and Gal Gadot, that, of course, uh, forever shut the door on, uh, on any kind of hope for a Snyderverse revival. So because of that, I basically lost interest in what DC was doing as well. And I haven't really bothered watching any of the more recent uh, DC movies in the last few years. I just stopped caring because it didn't, you know, without the Snyderverse, it didn't really seem like they had any kind of, uh, any kind of future, really. Although there is one exception. Uh, I did like the Batman that came out, the, uh, the Robert Pattinson Batman. Uh, I liked that film for what it was. Um, I still prefer Ben Affleck or Christian Bale in the role, uh, but I thought Robert Pattinson did a decent enough job. Uh, and I loved Colin Farrell as the Penguin in that. Um, and I liked uh, I liked the more crime drama nature of uh, 
of the of the Batman, right? They kind of took the more uh, Batman as this great detective approach, uh, rather than making it all about uh, you know fast paced action. Uh, it was a, again a, a more serious, darker treatment of the uh, the subject matter and a more grounded. Uh, much more grounded treatment of the subject matter, and I, I definitely appreciated that. I, I don't know where the, where we go with the Batman. You know, I don't know really what the point was. Um, if they're not going to do a whole reboot with this Batman, then I, you know, I don't know. So we'll see what happens. We'll see if there are any other Batman films with, you know, the Robert Pattinson incarnation of uh, of Batman. But as a standalone, uh, one-off type Batman entry. Uh, I do think Matt Reeves did a pretty good job with that one. By the way, if you're enjoying the content on this channel, do me a favor and please consider subscribing to the channel. Uh, and also don't forget to hit that notification bell while you're at it so you can be alerted when I'm posting videos that you might be interested in. And also don't forget to like the video as well. Um, it helps a lot more with the channel's visibility than uh, some people may realize. So thank you so much for your support. I really appreciate it. All right, so that just about brings us up to date, brings us to the now uh, and to the future. Um, so I'm going to talk for a few minutes here about where I'm at personally with uh, both Marvel and DC uh, and where I think they're headed. I'm definitely more uh, burned out on and disinterested in the Marvel stuff uh, than I am with DC. Um, I still have a little bit of hope that uh, maybe uh, DC can turn things around at some point, depending on what James Gunn does with his reboot. But I don't really have much hope for Marvel, uh, nor do I have any interest in uh, pretty much anything they're doing right now whatsoever. Now, I still like some of the old Marvel films, right? Like Incredible Hulk and uh, Iron Man and like some of the others I've talked about. But in recent years, I just think Marvel has put out a bunch of garbage, uh, especially in the last two years. And the reason I'm not very optimistic about Marvel uh, is because they've shown no sign really whatsoever of uh, changing course or uh, really even learning anything at all from their mistakes and misfires. So I'm basically done with Marvel uh, for the foreseeable future. And uh, I don't really see them being able to make any kind of uh, significant sustained comeback uh, anytime soon. I think it's going to be a while. I think they've done a lot of damage uh, to their brand. And I think it's going to be quite some time uh, before they're able to turn that around, if they're able to turn it around. They need to do some serious uh, self-reflection. And I'm not even sure if they're capable of that in the uh, current social, uh, cultural, and political climate. Now with DC, on the other hand, uh, I'll admit I am a little curious to see what James Gunn does with the new Superman movie that he's working on. If it ends up being a good movie and he's able to successfully reboot the uh, DC universe, then I may actually be interested in what DC has to offer. But it's going to have to be really well done uh, to uh, bring people back into the fold, I think. Uh, because I think a lot of people are uh, cynical, they're burned out, they're skeptical. I don't think people are as interested in the, uh, the lesser known characters uh, as much anymore. Uh, they turn out for the big franchise draws, you know, like Iron Man or Captain America or Superman or Batman. But, uh, you know, something like a Blue Beetle or a Black Adam, uh, that's just not going to cut it in this day and age, I don't think. I mean, I'd never even heard of Blue Beetle before the movie was announced. Uh, it was like, you know, like I said, I never read comics. So, I mean, people have read comics, people who are big comics fans, you know, they maybe know Blue Beetle. But, uh, you know, the average guy like me who just likes superhero movies, um, yeah, I'd never even heard of Blue Beetle before, uh, before the movie came out. And I think that's why that particular movie underperformed. I, in general, I just think there are a lot of people out there who are like me, you know, who never read the comics, who never got really into the comics, but who do like superhero movies and still enjoy them, or at least did at one point. And many of those people are just not going to turn out for some fringe character that they've never heard of. So let's get right down to the, uh, the big question here. Uh, is the live action superhero genre dying? Well, I'm not sure if I'd go quite that far, uh, depending on what we're talking about, uh, but I do think it is in very poor health right now and uh, you know, running on life support at the moment. As far as Marvel is concerned, the answer is absolutely yes. I do think the, uh, the genre is more or less dead for them. Uh, they may not be aware of it yet, but uh, you know, 
as far as the public perception is concerned, it sure seems like uh, you know they don't really have much of anything going on that people actually want to invest in. But between Marvel and DC, uh, I do think uh, DC could still offer a spark of hope that uh, perhaps that uh, excitement for the genre will be rekindled someday. I mean, I'm really hoping that James Gunn makes a kick-ass Superman movie. If he does, I think that will go a long way toward, uh, you know, fixing some of the problems uh, that uh, people are noticing about this genre. But one thing is definitely uh, for sure in my mind, uh, and that is superhero burnout is real. Uh, at the very least, just due to uh, oversaturation and uh, the championing of mediocrity uh, that we've seen in recent years. So I'm not totally sure what it's going to take to bring everyone back into the fold, uh, but I do think we're seeing a lot of people kind of give the superhero genre a bit of a breather uh, and uh, you know give it a rest for a little while. Uh, and I think, frankly, that's what Marvel and DC could stand to do as well. They, they could take a little pause, uh, allow people some time to actually miss the genre, right? And then come back with something really strong. But like I said, it's not clear to me that, that Marvel is uh, going to be capable of that. Um, I do think DC uh, could offer something good in the future, but uh, even that I'm not sure about. You know, uh, I'm still kind of on the fence about James Gunn in general. I'm not really sure what I think of him and uh, his whole groove there. So uh, I'm just kind of waiting to see what happens uh, with DC. But as far as Marvel is concerned, uh, yeah, I'm pretty much done with their movies. But all that said, uh, I'm not so burned out on the genre that I can't uh, at least enjoy some of the older movies uh, that actually were good. I do still like some of the older movies, especially those earlier uh, Marvel films uh, or the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy, like I said, or the uh, Christopher Nolan Dark Knight trilogy. Love all of those films. They're still fun for me to revisit from time to time, uh, but I did have to take a few years off. I had to take a little break for a few years uh, because of the superhero burnout I was feeling. So today I thought I'd go over some of the uh, live action superhero movies that I do still like. Um, and as such, I've got a top 10 list here for you of my favorites on physical media. And I'll even still have a few honorable mentions at the end. Not too many, just a few. Uh, so yeah, let's get right into this list. Though I should note real quick, I'm actually going to try to move through this list pretty quickly. Uh, quicker than I usually do if I'm able to do that. Uh, because this video is already pretty long. Uh, it turned out to be a much longer video uh, than I anticipated. Um, I've actually been working on this video for like a week, right? And uh, I expected to have it out a couple days ago, but it just turned into this behemoth. Um, that has uh, required a lot of uh, time and energy. But I at least wanted to uh, give you guys an idea of what some of my favorite superhero movies are uh, beyond just the ones I've already mentioned in this video. All right, so let's do this. Uh, coming in at number 10 is Captain America Civil War. Uh, probably my favorite Captain America film. Uh, and really, this is a great uh, Avengers film as well. Um, I think you can make the case this is easily every bit as much of an Avengers film as uh, any of the other Avengers films. The thing I've always liked about this film is the uh, political nature of it, right? Um, I don't talk about this on this channel very often, but uh, in my other life outside of this channel, uh, I am a bit of a political junkie. So I, I always take an interest in that kind of, uh, well, that kind of topic or anything that uh, kind of weaves politics into uh, the storyline. And I don't mean like political stuff happening, you know, in the real world here. I mean political stuff happening in the story. For this one, we had the Avengers split into competing factions. You have the uh, Captain America faction on one side, the Tony Stark uh, faction on the other side. And I'll just say this outright. Uh, I think in the movie, I think Captain America was right. And uh, Tony Stark was very, very wrong. But I really liked uh, what they did with the conflict here between the Avengers. And, uh, you know, I said earlier, you know, I tend to like... Uh, superhero movies that offer a little bit more of a grounded portrayal. Uh, and I kind of felt like this one did that a little bit by kind of bringing the politics into the thing. This one just seemed to have a little bit more realistic uh, vibe to it uh, as far as superhero movies go. So uh, yeah, love this film. Great film. Uh, it's up there among one of my favorite Marvel movies uh, to this day. So uh, yeah, Captain America Civil War. 
<laughs> Next up for number nine, I've always been a big fan of The Incredible Hulk. I mentioned this one earlier as well, so I won't spend too much time on this. Uh, yeah, Edward Norton as Bruce Banner and the Hulk. You really can't go wrong uh, with that kind of performance. And uh, uh, this, to this day, is still one of my favorite uh, Marvel movies. So, uh, yeah, I thought they did a good job with this one. And it's unfortunate that we never got any more Hulk movies or any, you know, standalone Hulk movies after this. Something tells me if they'd kept Edward Norton on board, uh, maybe we would have gotten uh, a standalone sequel at some point. So yeah, I love the Hulk uh, under the right conditions, of course. Uh, so yeah, Incredible Hulk and the 4K looks really good as well. Um, great looking 4K, just a fun movie all the way around, fun ride all the way around. So uh, yeah, The Incredible Hulk. Moving on to number eight, uh, we've got the X-Men trilogy, which I also mentioned earlier. Um, I think these three films, and really the first two, X-Men and uh, X-Men 2, uh, those are the ones that I like the most out of probably all the X-Men movies. I like the later X-Men movies as well, like um, X-Men First Class and Days of Future Past, but it's the first three films that I really liked uh, the most, the original X-Men trilogy before they uh, started introducing uh, James McAvoy or, or Michael Fassbender. And of course, you got a great cast too. You can't go wrong with Patrick Stewart, Hugh Jackman, uh, Ian McKellen, uh, Halle Berry, Anna Paquin. Uh, I think they all just did a great job uh, with this series. You know, really, it's the first film in this trilogy that I tend to love the most. So if I were to just pick any single film for, uh, for this entry, Entry, um, it would probably be the first X-Men movie, uh, but I really do like the entire trilogy. So yeah, X-Men trilogy, uh, this is definitely my jam. Uh, yeah, the X-Men rock. Okay, next up for number seven, uh, I chose Spider-Man 2, which I have here in the uh, the uh, Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy. Um, Spider-Man 2, great film. Uh, you got to love Doc Ock. He's uh, awesome. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed uh, Spider-Man 2. I think it is one of the best uh, superhero sequels we've ever seen. Um, you know, it's not... You know, there's other really good ones out there as well. Uh, but I always thought Spider-Man 2 was, you know debatably almost as good as the first one, if not better. I'm sure some people like the second one uh, a little more than the first one, but uh, I always thought it was a solid movie. Uh, I loved the way things played out in Spider-Man 2 between um, MJ and Peter Parker. Uh, it was great stuff. And uh, yeah, you know, great stakes. You know, I just thought this one was an awesome follow-up uh, to the first Spider-Man film. And, uh, you know, it did not disappoint in any way when I first saw it. So, uh, yeah, I love it. Spider-Man 2. And while we're on the topic of Spider-Man, let's do number six as well, which is the first Spider-Man film. It comes in at number six for me. Um, that really is uh, probably my favorite of the trilogy, but it's pretty close with uh, with Spider-Man 2. Uh, they're, they're close to equal for me. Uh, the first Spider-Man just kind of barely edged out uh, Spider-Man 2 for me. But I just thought Sam Raimi did an awesome job with these movies. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I uh, was a big fan of these. This was uh, Spider-Man 1. Uh, got the edge on this list because it was pretty pivotal to uh, bringing me back into the fold with the superhero genre. So as I mentioned earlier. So... Uh, yeah, significant movies for me that uh, I think are a ton of fun uh, to revisit. In fact, I was re-watching uh, Spider-Man 1 just the other day. Uh, it had been a while since I'd seen it, so uh, I uh, and I had fun with it. It's always great tapping into that nostalgia and revisiting uh, the movies that uh, shaped our views on this stuff, that shaped who we are, that shaped our tastes in these films. And of course, you can't go wrong with Willem Dafoe as the Green Goblin, right? Uh, he's awesome. I mean, he's awesome in anything he's in, but he uh, definitely delivered in Spider-Man 1. Uh, so yeah, Willem Dafoe, he's awesome. And to be clear here, I've liked pretty much all of the uh, the different Spider-Man movies over the years. Of course, uh, Tobey Maguire is my favorite, but I really like the Andrew Garfield movies as well. And I even like the Tom Holland movies, uh, not as much as the Andrew Garfield or Tobey Maguire movies, uh, but I have enjoyed uh, most incarnations of Spider-Man that we've seen uh to date. I've always loved Spider-Man, uh, not as much as uh, Batman and Superman, but I've always been a pretty big fan of Spider-Man. He was always up there uh, fairly high for me as well. 
So I got a lot of nostalgia for these uh, Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies. The third one wasn't as good, of course, but, uh, you know, the first two definitely were, uh, were solid. So, uh, yeah, so for number six, Spider-Man 1. Okay, next up, moving on to number five, uh, I chose Zack Snyder's Man of Steel, uh, a very uh, respectable uh, Superman movie in my view. Um, I, As I mentioned earlier, I love the work that uh, Zack Snyder does. I love his visual aesthetics, and I just thought he delivered a really good uh, interpretation of this story. Um, like I said earlier, I like the, uh, the slightly darker, more serious tone uh, that we get with the Zack Snyder movies. So, uh, you know, this is no exception in that regard. Uh, in fact, that's part of what caught my attention uh, about this uh, this release. So, uh, looks great on 4K, too. So, uh, yeah, Man of Steel at number five. Okay, next up for number four, uh, I'm, I'm cheating a little bit again here. Two movies here, uh, because I can't really separate them, at least not in my mind. Uh, that's Superman 78 and Superman 2. Um, you know, I always think of those two movies as kind of a singular experience, even though they weren't. Um, you know, they were certainly released a few years apart, but I always feel like uh, they're meant to be viewed almost together, right? Like uh, if I watch the first Superman film, uh, then I usually want to go right into the next one. Uh, you know, I don't want to just watch the first one and stop. Um, the second one, I think, is is arguably just as good. Um, although I, I do prefer the Richard Donner cut, and I do wish that Richard Donner had been able to uh, to fully realize you know, his vision for Superman 2. I think he got hosed uh, by the studio, if I remember correctly. And uh, we got a guy, who was it, Lester? Was that his name that was directing instead? Yeah, I would have much rather seen uh, Richard Donner be able to see this thing all the way through. Uh, but it was not to be the case. So, but absolutely love these films. A uh, huge, huge nostalgia here for these uh, since I saw the first one, like I mentioned, in the theater when I was seven years old. So, uh, yeah, I've just always loved these films. These films have always uh, had a special place in my heart. And uh, yeah, Superman 78 and Superman 2. Okay, and number three for me is going to be Zack Snyder's Justice League. Uh, I mentioned earlier, this is one of my favorite superhero films of all time, uh, despite its flaws. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's not quite my favorite, but it's up there, as you can see, uh, number three. This is one that I think is just a whole lot of fun. Uh, even with its flaws, uh, it's still a very enjoyable ride, very entertaining. And, uh, you know, as long as you got, you know, a three and a half, four hour block of time to uh, dedicate to it, you just can't go wrong with Zack Snyder's Justice League. Now, I know some people don't care for the fact that the aspect ratio on this is more like a four by three, right? I think it's like 1.33 to one or something. Some people don't like the aspect ratio on this one, um, which I get. Uh, I also understand what Zack Snyder was trying to do. He shot this film with IMAX in mind. Um, and so he was going for, for an IMAX type uh, feel with the aspect ratio. Now that would have been fine if we'd gotten, you know, a proper uh, theatrical release. Uh, but on home media, which is what ultimately we got it on, um, you know, the, the aspect ratio maybe doesn't quite work as well as uh, I think Zack Snyder was hoping. But that said, it's still a very enjoyable ride. Uh, and I would say that you do get used to the aspect ratio uh, after a few minutes, after watching it for a little while. Uh, you don't even think about it after a while. So if you've never seen uh, Zack Snyder's Justice League, I would highly recommend it. Of course, make sure it is Zack Snyder's Justice League and not the uh, Joss Whedon Justice League, which is crap, right? This is the good one. So uh, yeah, Zack Snyder's Justice League at number three. And next up for number two, we have The Dark Knight. Love this film, right? Huge fan of the, uh, the Nolan trilogy. Uh, and this was pretty hard uh, to uh, decide where to put this one, because this is probably my favorite uh, Christopher Nolan Batman film. Um, but, and I, and I got to say this while I'm at it, uh, let's get to number one so I can talk about them both together. Number one for me is uh, Batman Begins, right? This is probably my favorite superhero movie of all time. Um, but I think I like Dark Knight a little bit more, but it's very close. But the reason I put this one at number one is because it was such a pivotal movie for me. Uh, this, this, along with Spider-Man 1, 
uh, Batman Begins was a game changer for me in terms of my perception uh, about the superhero movie genre. And when I first saw this, the, the, with the darker tone, the more grounded uh, portrayal, um, with uh, you know, killer performances from uh, Killian Murphy as Scarecrow, who was you know, pretty creepy in this movie, uh, and then Morgan Freeman as well. You can't go wrong with Morgan Freeman. You can't go wrong with Michael Caine. Uh, just stellar cast in, uh, in, in all of these, uh, these uh, Dark Knight trilogy films. Uh, but this one has the most uh, importance to me personally because it really, it really turned things around for me in terms of how I looked at the superhero genre. Uh, so for that reason, it does have to be number one. But of course, you can't go wrong with uh, the Dark Knight and Heath Ledger's uh, portrayal of the Joker. I think you can easily make the case that Heath Ledger delivered one of the best performances uh, of, of probably any superhero movie ever made. Uh, certainly of the, uh, the Dark Knight trilogy, the Nolan Dark Knight trilogy. But I mean, Heath Ledger, what he did was with the Joker was awesome in this movie. Um, he was just incredible performance from Heath Ledger. So I almost put this as my number one just because I, I, I think I like it slightly more than Batman Begins, but because of the... Uh, historical importance, uh, personal historical importance of Batman Begins for me, um, you know, it worked out the way it did, right? So, but these two, the Dark Knight trilogy, these two are probably my top two favorite superhero movies of all time. And uh, I, just, I just love them. I mean, you just can't go wrong with Christopher Nolan, am I right? So uh, yeah, Batman Begins and the Dark Knight, these rock. Okay, so that wraps it up for my top 10. But of course, as promised, I do have a few very quick honorable mentions here. Uh, we're almost done here, guys, with this video. I know it's a long one, uh, but let me just uh, throw these out there real quick. Uh, I have to at least mention uh, Batman and Batman Returns, the Michael Keaton Batman movies. Um, like I said, I never saw these for many years. Certainly didn't see them when they first came out. And uh, only watched these for the first time maybe two years ago. Uh, and I really liked them. I, you know, I thought they were great. Um, but, uh, and I couldn't believe it had taken me so long to finally get around to watching them, especially being the big Batman fan that I am. Uh, of course, I'm still partial to, uh, Christian Bale and Ben Affleck as Batman, but I, you know, I love Michael Keaton too. I've always loved Michael Keaton as an actor and, uh, you know, he did a great job with these movies. Of course, uh, you know, Danny DeVito in this, Michelle Pfeiffer. Um, so yeah, just great stuff. Uh, and these look outstanding on 4k. If you don't have these on 4k yet, uh, I would definitely recommend them if you're a fan of these films, uh, especially Batman Returns. Uh, some people might, uh, even call this a reference uh, quality 4K. So, um, but I think they both look great uh, on the format. So if you've been in the market for them, you might want to think about picking them up at some point. And then on the topic of Batman, I did mention this briefly earlier, uh, The Batman, which uh, I also really liked. Uh, I liked the, uh, the crime drama uh, nature of this particular Batman film. Uh, I thought Matt Reeves did a pretty good job here. I thought Robert Pattinson did a pretty good job. It's certainly not my favorite uh, representation of Batman, but I, I like that it uh, it took more of like a murder mystery kind of approach, right? It almost was like uh, Batman meets Seven, right? The, the Morgan Freeman, Brad Pitt, David Fincher film. Yeah, um, this one had a lot of Seven vibes in it or, or that type of kind of dark uh, murder mystery crime drama type vibe. This was probably the most grounded portrayal of Batman to date uh, that we've seen in film. And that's a big part of why I like this one. Uh, even though it's not my favorite Batman movie, uh, I like what they did with it. I like where they took uh, the, the vibe and the story and whatnot. So uh, yeah, it's like a Batman is a detective, right? So yeah, I had fun with this one. And uh, you know, I'll be curious to see if Matt Reeves does another uh, sequel to this, if he expands on this at all, or if this ends up just being a one-off thing and that's all, all she wrote, right? Uh, so yeah, but I do like uh, the Batman. I thought they did a good job with it.
And of course, I got to mention Iron Man, right? Uh, you know, the very first Iron Man, uh, one of the better Avengers movies uh, ever made. Um, and it's one I can still enjoy to this day. I still enjoy revisiting uh, every now and then. So uh, uh, although it's been, I think, quite a few years since I've watched this. I, I watched this with my kid probably like three, four years ago. But uh, I just love the whole origin story of how Tony Stark uh, got to be Iron Man. And I will say it's also unfortunate that uh, Terrence Howard wasn't able to continue in the MCU because I actually like Terrence Howard more in this one than I liked uh, Don Cheadle. Um, even though both are great actors, I like both Don Cheadle and Terrence Howard, uh, I just thought that Terrence Howard uh, was better for the role. Uh, and of course, we got Jeff Bridges in this, who is always great. So uh, yeah. Uh, this is definitely uh, on its way to becoming a superhero classic, I think. Uh, great film. And then finally, I got to mention Deadpool. I mean, who doesn't love Deadpool, right? Uh, I'm always a fan of R-rated uh, superhero movies. Uh, in fact, in my view, we don't get nearly enough R-rated superhero movies. And, uh, you know, this is a tour de force for Ryan Reynolds. I don't think anybody can dispute that. So, uh, yeah, really edgy um, and really funny. Um, yeah, and this is one exception I make to my, uh, my, uh, my comedy rule. I'm not usually into, uh, the comedic aspect of this stuff, but Deadpool was an exception. This is hilarious. And, uh, you know, I got a real kick out of this one. So Deadpool, my last honorable mention. Okay, so that about wraps it up for my uh, my big video on live-action superhero movies. Uh, let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Uh, let me know what you think of my list, uh, and what are some of your favorite uh, superhero movies. I would love to hear from you. And also let me know what you think of my thoughts on the current state of the industry and where I think we're headed. Uh, did I piss any of you off, or are you guys right there with me on this stuff? I always love hearing from you guys, so uh, make sure you leave some feedback in the comments down below. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe, maybe share the video if you're feeling so inclined out there. Uh, thanks so much for watching today, guys. I really appreciate it, and I'll see you soon.